live from the Orlando headquarters of the Seco Clark Law Group, and I, and I am honored to have here with me today, dear friend, fellow Jamaican, fellow boss, immigration attorney, that cleaner, every publication, the list too long, <laughs> but attorney Tremaine Hemans. Thank you for joining me today. I am so excited to be here. Yeah. So humbling that you would even ask me to do this. So I'm super excited. Go way back. Way, way back. Way back from when you were a law student. Yep. When you were working for the government. Yep. And now, beautiful practice in South Florida. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Introduce Very yourself cool. to the people. Them. I know you have your fans, but <laughs> introduce, introduce yourself to my people. All right. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Tremaine Hammonds. I practice immigration law in South Florida. But I run mostly a virtual practice, so my clients are all over the U.S., uh, primarily New York, California, Georgia, and Panama City and South Florida. Big up yourself to all my clients. <laughs> um, I grew up in Monique St. Anne. I'm from the country in Jamaica. I came here when I was 17 and pursued this law dream vehemently for 13 years until I was able to start practicing in 2019. Um, this is my passion. I, I got the opportunity to work at um, ICE when I was in law school. So I've seen the other side of uh, what it takes to be successful in um, applying for a benefit in this country. I, you know, I was in law school. Everybody knows Saku Clark. Come on, if you're into track, you already know who this is. No introduction needed. So I was kind of following his career when I was in law school. And I was like, look at this boss Jamaican just doing it out here. And I went in his DMs to tell him I wanted to be like him when I grew up. Wow. And that's literally how our mentorship relationship yeah, started. Yeah. And I mean, I saw I saw Tremaine as just like the female version of me, you know, hungry, all about kicking ass and taking names, all about being um, humble, but eager for success. With a little bit of flash to it and charisma. Yeah. Just have to commit. Just have to commit. Like, um, but I mean, the biggest thing that I'm proud of here today that we're going to discuss amongst other things is the fact that you can have two Jamaicans who practice the same areas of law, but we support each other 100%. And I think it is one thing that is lacking within the Jamaican community and within the minority community is just two Jamaicans who they know that, hey, um, two combined is always better than two yeah. separated. No. Yeah. You know, so so we always support each other, and today you get the best of both worlds. Right. Forty under forty, both, both of us. us. <laughs> I, I'm still I'm still hanging on there. I'm still hanging on. I'm still hanging on. Um, but I thought it was only fitting for us to really dive in into some serious immigration issues that are at bar. No pun intended. Um, especially being in Florida. My practice is in Orlando, Panama City, and New York. Um, Tremaine services all those areas as well. Mm -hmm. But especially for Floridians, Floridian um, immigrants, and those also in New York. So we're going to dive straight in, Tremaine, yeah. into Mr. Governor DeSantis himself and the new bill that will come into effect on July 1st. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you corrected me that it's no longer SB 1718 because it has, uh, it's no longer in the Senate. It's FL 1718 because it is law and will come into effect July 1st. Yep. So, I mean, I have been telling my base about what to expect. Mm -hmm. um, give, give us an idea of your rendition, of your understanding of the bill. Right. So I've been reading it since its first iteration, just watching what was going to happen. Thankfully, there's a lot of frightening things that were taken out of it. So I feel like I've been working a lot to dispel a lot of the myths because everybody's thinking you cannot transport people in your car within the state of Florida. Or, you know, if you have immig um, immigrant family members who are undocumented, that they now have to move and they can't live with you anymore. And that's not true. That was in, when it was introduced, that was one of the um, <clears throat> things that they wanted to put in it. But thankfully, that's one of the things that got removed. So what remains is that now if you're trying to transport an undocumented person across state lines into the state of Florida, now that has been criminalized. Yes. Right. 
And then um, the most frightening thing to me is this thing with employers. Like, um, I think it's some someone the numbers of 700,000 yeah. people in the workforce in Florida uh, are immigrants. And yeah. most of them are undocumented, you know. So this thing you now where he's requiring that employers use uh, the system called E-Verify to, you know, check if your employees are all documented is definitely going to affect the economy here. Like, so crazy. Like, I see that happening. It's already started happening. Everybody's yeah. leaving. Construction sites are empty. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot the of honest girls. Yep. I know empty. A lot of my clients are um, t- on consultations. I'm sure you've heard this that people yep. are losing their jobs already. Exactly. Because the employers are now, especially if they are, because a lot of people don't know, sometimes they can work out a little thing, work at Chick fil A or McDonald's yeah. or something. You know, they that. can't do that anymore because they're definitely going to be required to use a fire fact. The reason being is because um, places like those have over 20 guys and employees, yeah. and that's who's required to use it. So there's also that. Um, they're also requiring that if a, a hospital accepts Medicaid, that they now have to disclose someone's immigration status, right? However, if they ask you that on the forum, you can just not answer. You don't have to answer that question. Just don't so um, I've been telling people that enforcing this is going to be problematic for the state because once you have people like us in your corner, we're going to tell you how to finesse it and get around it, you know what I mean? And not only that, um, just the logistics of enforcing this just don't make sense to me. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, those are the big the big ones that jumped out at me. Which ones jumped out at you? Yeah, I mean, everything that you said uh, are, are definitely the ones that jump out at me. My concern, though, is, um, I mean, just to go constitutional law, right? Yeah. Federalism is the separation of the federal government and the state, uh-huh. right? So previously, typically, a regular law enforcement, um, you know, whether it's sheriff, um, call PC, yeah. Mm-hmm. Typically, they would not be able to ask you about your immigration status mm-hmm. because immigration is a federal issue. Right. But no, what this bill does, it commingles federal yeah. and state. So now law enforcement is now, just by the standard of reasonable suspicion, they will be able to ask you your immigration status. Right. And, I mean, it depends on the mood on that day. You understand? They can use that against yes. you. And, I mean, we've seen that. So the, so that's my concern for my clients is that no law, um, state law enforcement is mere emboldened mm-hmm. to ask for your immigration status, which, I mean, I know a lot of immigrants themselves. I mean, just an encounter with law enforcement, they are not fearful. Of course. So sometimes that fear manifests itself in bad decision. Right. You know, so that's my concern. So no law, law, um, state police can now contact ICE mm-hmm. and say, hey, we have an undocumented person right. here. And here's the thing, people, if you, if, if you are not a U.S. citizen, Right, and you are asked your immigration status by ICE. You're not a U.S. citizen, and you don't have ID. You have to tell them, which is, which is unfortunate. You have to tell them. However, can they search you or your home without a warrant? No, they can search your person if there's reasonable suspicion that you have committed a crime, or if you are not a U.S. citizen. Right. So those are my big concerns. I mean, of course, um, employers that have over 25 employees, as you said, they will have to register with the E-Verify where they're going to have to um, submit within three days. Yeah. But they're also going to have to keep records no. for, for three years, yes. which, you know, again... I mean, I feel like that's uncons- um, unconstitutional Absolutely. because because then no, you are treating someone differently because of their nationality, because of their immigration status. But you know what? Because we practice federal law, we already know what's going to happen. There's going to be a um, federal suit against the state of Florida. I already know that. But I also think that that was his plan. Yes. Because I always tell people that he's 10 times more dangerous than the other guy because he understands the law. And I think yes. that's what he wants. Yeah. Because a lot of the courts are packed with conservative judges who might yes. push this through. But at the end of the day, the Constitution is the Constitution. Mm-hmm. And this is so far reaching out of what the state can do. But I really think um, it's going to be a matter of time before uh, this is scaled back a lot. I One, think. 100%. Which... 
pivots me to my next point. I mean, I'm sure you've seen it uh, already. The big question and the big thing is all the immigrants are now leaving Florida to go to New York and other states, yeah. which, I mean, we can understand. Of course. Fears. But because of the disinformation and, um, I mean, simply put, just a misunderstanding, yes. you now you have people who are they're, they're now putting their immigration case in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. So, people, if you have a pending petition, right, if you have a pending petition, if you are in removal proceedings and you have not received a, a removal order, you shouldn't leave, right. right? Right? If somebody files you, if you are in the process of doing that, do not leave because that will now disrupt your immigration yeah. process. For instance, if you're if you filed for asylum, right, there's something called the asylum clock. And if you move from one state to the next, you have to disclose your change of address. Changing your address is going to change the venue of where your case is. And that is what they call a delay that you have caused in your case. And when that happens, it pauses your asylum clock. That's a holy pub legally is foolishness to say. When you file your asylum, you, 150 days afterwards, you can file for your employment authorization. If you haven't filed for your employment authorization, actually, if you haven't received it yet, and you decide to move, you've now disrupted that clock. And you're not going to be eligible to file for that um, EAD, employment authorization, in that amount of time. So is it really worth it for you to pack up yourself and leave when you already filed your case in court, and just wait the 150 days until you get your employment authorization? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, 100% correct. So, again, if you are in the state of Florida and you are very concerned about this immigration bill that will, um, I, I mean, that will now become law into effect July 1st, if you have a pending petition where somebody filed for you, whether it's your spouse, your child, you have something in the immigration, some application, asylum, VAWA, once it's filed, you do not have to leave the state. Mm -hmm you are not regarded as undocumented legally because you will have a pending petition. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. But would you advise clients to leave who do not have anything pending, they are undocumented, what would you advise those people? Honestly, I'm really wary of telling people to leave because I've gotten reports from a few consultations that people are being harassed in airports because at the end of the day, these airports still operate within the state of Florida, right? So I am very wary of telling people to go put themselves in front of anywhere that's mm -hmm. going to potentially have them have further issues. You understand? I get it. Like, if you have lost your job, and you have to work, and you have to move, then I get it. I just want people to make sounder decisions. Yes. My thing is, before you pick up yourself and move, go to somewhere else, at least speak to an attorney to see if you have any options before you decide to leave. Right. So I get it. In certain situations, yes, you have no choice but to move. If you're not going to be able to work, you're not going to be able to move around. But again, because of the myths that are going around that, oh, you cannot trans we can't even take Uber no more. Yeah. That's not true. That's not true. You know what I mean? So it's I just say let's be patient and see. Mm -hmm. I know it's scary right now. Everybody's gonna tell me it's easier said than done. My mom, big up Auntie Donna, my mother was here for many, many years undocumented. So this is something that's personal to my family. So I understand. But you really want to make sure that you consider all your options before you pick up yourself and leave. So that's my concern. Yeah. And I have the same concerns as well. And I mean, just to circle back on some of the things that stood out to me with that bill is Previously, people could use an out-of-state ID, right? An out-of-state ID and use that as as verification or even for employment. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that the bill has shut down. So if you have, for instance, like a New York or or, or a California driver's license, mm -hmm. but you're undocumented, right? Um, that's no longer allowed in the mm -hmm. state of Florida. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's 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 tough, you know, from a legislative standpoint. I can understand it. You know, as an officer of the court, I can understand. However, I don't believe in overlooking the state of Florida and the industries that will know so far. Well, yeah. I feel like if you're going to implement such a sweeping immigration bill, there has to be concessions. Of course. Because no, everybody going to feel it. Because, yeah. I mean, it's no secret, you know, immigrants, I mean, for a state like Florida where tourism is one of the 
oh no, is the biggest um, source of revenue. You have hotels. Yep. Right. You have um, fab restaurant. One of fab restaurants. I mean, you parks. I mean, all the main industries in in the state of Florida relies on immigration. But again, make some decisions, right, and make sure you're going based off truth and not myths. Right. Again, one of the biggest myths that um, Attorney Evans mentioned was um, it is now illegal to harbor transport undocumented immigrants. No, that is not true. That will not be criminalized. However, what is not criminalized is, for instance, if you have a child that is undocumented right. and you transport that child outside of the state of Florida into the state of Florida, that is no considered human trafficking, human yeah. smuggling, right. and um, it will now fall under the the RICO Act, yep. uh, which is a federal tool for prosecution. So, so that's another consideration to be made for people who are picking up themselves and leaving. Are you never planning on coming back to Florida? Exactly. Until this law is lifted, you know what I mean? There's a lot to consider. Yeah. Um, so s speaking of going from outside of the state, coming into the state, you know, in listening to, to Governor DeSantis, in his words, his reasoning for implementing that is to to show his strength for the border control. So that is a perfect segue for us to talk about asylum. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I mean, as you know, asylum, if you cross the border, um, if you cross the U.S. border uninspected um, because you're fleeing from your own country because of fear of persecution, mm -hmm because you belong to a protected class, such as race, religion, uh, just nationality, political opinion, or if you belong to a social group, mm -hmm. right? You can come into the country and file an asylum application, right. which you have to do before your one year anniversary of entering the country, mm -hmm. right? You are able to file an asylum petition. So there's a lot of misinformation now since asylum has become heavy. Right. First thing we want to tackle, and people run me down about this all day, every day, on every social media platform, it's, right, I will just grab the, grab the boat by its hands. <laughs> right? It's grabbing. Is, if you enter the country across the border, can you then get married to a U.S. citizen and adjust your status within the country? So before them jump down my throat, no, go to get mine. Absolutely not. You will give your opinion. You cannot. And again, this is not opinion. We are lawyers. We study and practice this. This is what the law says. If you have come through the border, right, you entered without inspection, you are not then eligible to adjust your status within the United States. Adjustment of status requires a lawful entry and inspection for you to be able to file from in here. Right. So if you come through the border, they can file the I-130 for you, yes. But then you're going to have to leave and go back to your home country to do your interview to get an immigrant visa to come back. Right. So all the village lawyers and your uncle, cousin, best friend. And the Google lawyer. Right. That's telling you, you yeah, mind, I did it. No, they didn't. <laughs> that is not what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, you are absolutely not able to do that. So. Um, a lot of people said that, yeah, man, my friend said they did it and they, yeah, they, they need to expect a denial soon or they haven't told you that they already got that denial. It's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, because what I find also, a lot of people will be like, yeah, man, I did it myself, but they won't tell you the issues that arose when they did that themselves. You know what yeah. I mean? So them get three IRP, one notice of intent to deny or something. Exactly. <laughs> they don't tell you that part. Yeah. So, I mean. I have gotten people approved for their green card who entered uninspected. So right. this is how it typically goes, right? You have John Doe. Mm -hmm. John Doe cross, crosses the border. Um, he he He's uninspected. Right. Enters the country. He then now files for asylum. So he has an, right. app so he has an asylum application. Typically, he's already in removal proceedings, mm -hmm. meaning that you are in immigration court right right john doe gets his first hearing it's a master hearing in immigration court 
and they say, what is your relief from deportation? Why shouldn't we send you back home? Mm -hmm. He's going to say, Your Honor, I filed for asylum. Okay? You are going to ha now have to prove the basis, mm -hmm. the grounds of your asylum, why it should be granted, you know? Whether if John Doe is saying um, he's getting persecuted because he's, he's a homosexual and that's not um, that's not something that is accepted in is, this country. Is accepted in John Doe's own country. Mm -hmm. So, Your Honor, um, I I want refuge in the United States. They said, Okay, all right, we're going to set your individual hearing, which is a trial, mm -hmm. to go over the merits of your asylum. Right. Typically, it's a year and a two um, year, two years old. Yeah. So no, before that hearing, John Doe gets married to a U.S. citizen. Right. Right? So John Doe gets married to a United States citizen and he files for adjustment of status. Right. So he files the I-130. It's a petition for alien relative. Mm -hmm. That gets approved, right, based right. on being on a bona fide marriage. That, it, that, that, that gets filed with USCIS. Right. However, he now gets that... That I want her to now get sent to NVC, the right. National Visa yeah. Center, uh -huh. because they look at it and they say, hey, you entered uninspected. Uh -huh. So now, in order for us to process this, you are going to have to go through consular processing, which is right. outside of the country. Mm -hmm. So now what my office has to do is we file with the NVC, right. and we also have to file a waiver. Mm -hmm. We have to file a 601 waiver, which... Um, in layman terms, excuses is unlawful entry. unlawful entry. Right. Once that waiver is granted, then my office would schedule the interview in his home country. Right. You know, leaves the home country, uh, you know, leaves the U.S., goes back to his home country. Sometimes it takes two weeks to a month. Right. He gets an interview. They go over the merits of the waiver to say, okay, his U.S. citizen spouse will suffer hardship. Will suffer hardship. Mm -hmm. It is up. Is he now re-enters the country on a non-immigrant visa and then gets a green card. So we have done it that way. Mm -hmm. But if you think that you're going to file with an uninspected entry and you are going to get your green card just by staying in the U.S. and don't have to go on, it it's not going to work. <laughs> Granted, there are some exceptions. Right. Sure. If you meet uh, the unlawful inspection or other benefits that you the, can get in immigration. The unlawful inspection. Right. So there's certain benefits <coughs> that you can get in the immigration court. So I always try to tell my clients that sometimes if you've been placed in removal proceedings, it's not always a death sentence because there's certain things that you can apply for uh, in court that you couldn't otherwise at USCIS. For instance, there's something called cancellation of removal for a non-permanent residence, right? Where if you've been here for a certain amount of time, you've maintained good moral character, and you have a qualifying family member that's going to suffer hardship, you may be able to stay based on that, right? right? So that's one of my favorite ones too, to use. Also, VAWA. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, so VAWA has been a, a hot topic the last two, three years. Yeah. Um, President Biden had expanded mm -hmm. um the VAWA laws and 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 how you can be eligible for VAWA. So typically with a VAWA, what is required, um so VAWA stands for violence against women's act. Originally it was to protect women mm -hmm. who or immigrants who got married to United States citizens, but then now they're suffering abuse mm -hmm. and they didn't get their petition. However, it was expanded to cover men and different types of abuse. It's no longer only physical abuse, but it's also psychological, emotional, or mm -hmm. even if you have a spouse that is using your immigration status against mm -hmm. you. Economic it, deprivation too. Yeah. Not um, helping you financially. And not helping you financially. Or if they just left the marriage and disappeared. So yeah. So that's a way that if you did get married to the mm -hmm. United States and you can file for a bar if you're qualified. Right. But the uh, I mean, I, I'd say the, the, the interesting thing about VAWA is that if you had an uninspected entry, yeah. You still can file for VAWA and you won't have to return to your own country. You can adjust your status within the US. US. Right. So so that's interesting mm -hmm. as well to, you know, to definitely consider. And that's also another reason why you need to discuss your options with a lawyer. Because yes, the rule is the rule, right? 
but there's a few exceptions to everything. Like a lot of people don't even realize in certain cases, you don't even have to be married to the U.S. citizen, like legally married to the U.S. citizen. I had a case where uh, she got married to the U.S. citizen and found out later that um, she was committing bigamy, right? That he was already married, didn't get divorced from the previous spouse. There's an exception to the VAR rule that says if you reasonably thought that you were married, right, but based on the lies that the abuser told you, you found out later that you really weren't married, you may still be able to file. So there's a lot of exceptions to the laws, and that's yeah. what we are here for, right? So we big book them so you don't have to do that. Yeah, so, <laughs> and, and, and I mean, this segues in perfectly into another topic as why you should hire an immigration attorney. Uh, we are not here to sell you anything, okay? We are busy. Yeah, I understand. We're not busy. So we're yeah. not here to sell you as to why you need an immigration attorney. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me personally, if you've been following me and you know my journey, I mean, I came here on a student visa on an athletic scholarship, but I found myself without status as well. And, I mean, by this time, I... I already graduated from college. My father ring on my phone and I said, why you not come back to Jamaica? You are in the U.S. undocumented. Why? You know? That aside, if it wasn't for my immigration attorney at the time mm -hmm. to figure out a way to get me back working and uh, to get me back in status and eventually get me my green card, I mean, why wouldn't I trust an immigration attorney? Sure. People think that you know, yo, you can't fill out the form in yourself. You know, I have an account and I have a CPA. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a party girl around the road. I am know this person. Yeah. You can't fill it out. In these times, that's not smart. That is not smart. Why? Because a document preparer, if they mess up your case and you are now in removal proceedings, or they messed up one petition, then you're now trying to apply for your citizenship or remove your conditions and they made a mistake, you can't go back after them. I, I always try to tell people that as well. If the only reason you hire a lawyer is because of the security that we are licensed and you have someone to complain about to in case something egregious happens in your case, and I certainly must go call the bar now because the people that don't call it back in 24 hours. You might have been like, the mistakes made in your case that really affected you. You have someone to complain to. I can't tell you how many people have called me and said, you know, I'm going to pay the lady $7,000 now, I can't find her. And then I'm like, okay, well, where was this person? And they, everybody, especially in our community, they refer to everyone as lawyers, yeah. right? So, yeah, I'm called a lawyer and should not pick up the phone no more. I'm like, okay, give me the address. Let me pop it in Google and give me the person's name. Not on any bar website. Right, because we are all on directories. Yeah. Like licensed attorneys are on directories. You can literally see if there's ever been any suspension, if them have any complaints against us, if we're in good standing, all of that, especially Florida. Right. But I, more than one time, I can tell you that I Google the address and it's an open lot somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then what are you supposed to do? They're like, well, what do I do? You cannot do anything. No. You cannot do anything. The person gone about them business probably skip on gone or came, came on or something with your money. So you have to be very careful. Uh, the, the, the worst one I've seen uh, recently is this lady paid quite a big sum. There are people out here telling people that you can just file for a, a work a, um, employment authorization. Uh, I've heard about that. You, you can't can just, not just, just, you know, just file for a work permit. Yeah. I always tell people that U.S. Um, US immigration is always based in an anchor. There has to be some reason for them to give you an immigration benefit. Mm -hmm. And a work permit is anchored in another <laughs> application. Yes. So it's usually based off of something, an underlying petition or application. You can't just file that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of scams going on with that. Um, this recent lady told me that um, the woman told her that there's a new program and she can't just file an I-360, which is a VAWA application. The lady says, yeah, but well, you know, what is that? Because I've never been married. I said, what do you mean? Never been married. So you have any children? Because there's a few things you can file about what based on. No children, never been married. So I said, why? What is this person based on this? She said, she never even know that's what they're filed. They're signing people's signatures and stuff. So I really just want everyone to be careful. Do your research. Even when I go live weekly with my following and I tell them, even me. Yeah, you might like my outfit. You see all my mentor trash and him look nice, right? Just and everybody that can do this 
in a picture that cross them hand. <laughs> <laughs> Not everybody that crossed them hand in a picture should get your money. You need to do your research on people. If the right. person don't even have a Google page on Google, that's a huge red flag. flag. She red flag. You understand Instagram alone cannot be the reason you hire somebody. Yeah, and I think one really um one point that you definitely should consider with with hiring an attorney, even even if it's for a simple immigration case. Mm -hmm. But generally, most attorneys, they have seen a whole yeah. bunch of different type of cases, yeah. right? Every case won't end up the same way. So say you started a simple filing process, but then your circumstances change. So suppose you realize that your husband that petitioned for you now had a child outside of the marriage. Mm -hmm. That affects your case. And if you're not advised properly for the interview, then you're facing a denial. Yep. Right? Suppose now you're in the interview, and this has, I mean, I have been with a client in an interview, and everything is going good, and they say, oh, where do you live now? Texas. I say, all right. Is that where you first entered when you came on your visitor's visa? The person said, yes, Texas. And I say, oh, so now you're aligned to an immigration officer because I'm looking at your B2 visa application right here. Oh, my God. And it says that you entered in um, Florida. Mm -hmm. That is a, misrepresent um, a misrepresentation. So if you don't have a lawyer present to say, hold on, immigration officer. That's not a material misrepresentation. That's not a material <laughs> misrepresentation. That could have been a scrivener's error. Right. That could have been an error. And my client is not signing anything. Right. To say that that is a misrepresentation. Oh, right. Then no... The case is here, but mm -hmm. if you have a um have your bridging from down the road or the lady who deal with paperwork, she cannot she cannot come to the interview with and she right. cannot save you. Mm -hmm. You have a ball to God. Mm -hmm. Bow to Jesus. More see even more serious is asylum applications. Because yes. you now a lot of people are telling people, Yeah man, just file the asylum you're just you're afraid to go back, you're afraid to go back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Asylum applications aren't like um, let's say a concurrent file with the I one thirteen or I four eight five. Where if it's denied, nine times out of ten, they give yes. you a chance to it's refile. A point. If you yeah. get denied at USCIS for your asylum, you are going to immigration court. Yeah. And when you're landing in immigration court now, Miss Nancy Udu paperwork has disappeared. She already met her money. Mm -hmm. That was to file the application and know you are up the creek by yourself. Nine times out of ten, not even knowing what was in that initial application which they're going to look at that initial application. They allow you to file a new one in court. But like I said, I've worked with ICE, and you better believe they look at that initial application. It has to match up at least a little bit with yeah. the first one. Yeah. So you really have to be careful. Yeah, so, I mean, again, great point. I've seen this happen so many times. So, so again, John Doe comes in on a visa. He has Miss Nancy from down the road file an asylum application for him. But what he does not, what John Doe does not understand is once that asylum application is filed with USCIS, right? Mm -hmm. If it gets denied, once it gets denied, you are automatically in removal proceedings. Yep. And once you're in removal proceedings, there has to be an attorney that's either going to, one, try to adjudicate that asylum, right. try to argue that asylum for you on the marriage, but if you didn't know what Miss Mansi put in it, it's one. going to get denied and you're going to right. have a removal order. Right. And in court, there are um, defenses that you can use if you had an attorney who made a mistake on your court. Correct. Them not going after Miss Nancy and no. there's nothing in the law that says they can go after them for that. You can't say they can try to say yeah. But case law supports if it was an attorney that mm -hmm. made the mistake. So, so I know somebody's thinking this. So what happens if you file the asylum, Ms. Nancy filed the asylum for you, but then you fall in love mm -hmm. and you got married to a U.S. citizen. Right. You're still in removal yeah, proceedings. <laughs> and what a lot of people don't understand is that if you are issued a notice to appear to immigration court mm -hmm. and then you get married after that, mm -hmm. if there's a presumption of marriage fraud. Yep. So... Then, no, your attorney is going to have to try to overcome that presumption that mm -hmm. you didn't enter into that marriage right. 
just to circumvent the immigration laws. Mm -hmm. And there, that's also another point I want to make because I try to I try to keep my ears to the ground, especially on TikTok because that's where all the new lawyers are apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen where a lot of people are saying, yeah, man, even if they say the marriage fraud thing, you can still overcome it sometimes, right? If it is a presumption of marriage fraud, then you may be able to overcome it. But if there is a finding of marriage fraud, which I have seen those, if you get a decision with like 17 pH and then go to Uncle Roy, who will live in Panama City and you would live here, so all about it. Because when they do these investigations, they do these investigations. So if it is a finding of marriage fraud, Nobody on the planet can help you with it. Yeah, it and, 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 and this leads perfectly into our next topic, which is marriage fraud, the big thing, right? This big marriage. thing, yeah. This is my very. So what a lot of people don't understand, which is what you just said, <laughs> if, you, if there is a finding of marriage fraud on your file and your case gets denied, any subsequent, any, any immigration thing that you file for after will be denied. So... Yeah. What is a finding of marriage fraud? So I'll talk about sure. a, um, a case that I just did, and um, I didn't take the case. Mm -hmm. So again, I'll use John Doe. John Doe came, came to my office and said, big man, you know, um, they deny my second marriage. I don't understand what I'm going on. All right. So I said, all right, let me look through the file. The first marriage that John Doe had, there was a finding of marriage fraud. So I'm looking through the file. So. In the decision letter for the denial, they said that there were discrepancies mm -hmm. within the interview. Okay. So I'm reading through it. All right. So the interviewer, and I'm reading through the interview asking John Doe and John Doe's wife. The interview asked John Doe, where did you propose to your wife? John Doe responds, in the kitchen at our house. Mind you, they are separated. The wife, in her response, she says, he did not propose. Next question. What? <laughs> <Not done. laughs> they asked John Doe, and, and I'm not laughing at the person. I'm just like, people need to be prepared, mm -hmm. you know? They asked John Doe in the interview, and, I, and I'm reading it. Mm -hmm. Which is the last movie that you and your wife watched together? Mm -hmm. John Doe said, a Western when you look at the wife response, which movie she last watched, she said, yeah, it was um, a series on Netflix. So they ask one last question, how many bedrooms are in the house? John Doe confidently said three. Mm -hmm. The wife said, we live in a one bedroom apartment. But you know, father. So obviously the officer assesses that there's also a big age difference, Uh huh. right? Um, they couldn't answer the same or they couldn't provide the same answer for how many people were at the wedding. So that's a huge discrepancy. Yeah. And there's and, and there's no a finding that if you can if both of you as a couple, as a married couple, cannot answer those basic questions, there's a finding. This is, this marriage was entered into for the sole purpose of circumventing US immigration law. Mm -hmm. Once you get that that it uh, you cannot even if your next marriage you are married with four kids and our properties business thriving influencer traveling over the u.s it's still going to be denied because of the finding of marriage fraud a lot of people think that you know okay i can't do it through marriage but i have a child here so when the child turns 20 nope yeah no, no matter immigration all the future benefits the the most serious one i saw uh, that's honestly the most detailed investigation I've ever seen. But I worked in the fraud unit for one semester, and yeah, they had interns assigned to review people's social media. Yes. That's what I did for a whole semester of law school. Mm -hmm. And um, this gentleman, same thing, my John Doe, he, this is his second marriage, right? The first marriage. They were tracking him from what he put on his CBP form when he came into the country. He said that he was going to Florida, but he went to Arizona, let's say, mm -hmm. right? Um, he said he was coming to come visit her, right? But him gone someplace else, which was where the second wife came, mm -hmm. right? So um, the marriage didn't work out. They never lived together, right? Everything filed and said, 
that he lives in Florida with the wife. Because a lot of you operate on this, how them going to know exactly. mentality. Know. If the federal government wants to know something, they will they find, find out. out. Okay. So what happened is, um, filed the applications and everything for the second marriage. And the USCIS oh, wait there. Because the fraud finding was found and based on the second application. They had already denied the first one, mm -hmm. but it, there was no fraud finding there. They did the investigation and found out that while he was married to first wife, he had a child with second wife, yeah. right? And they concealed that pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Because on all these forms in the guys, you have to disclose your children. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. These forms are very detailed and they know what they're doing. It all is interwoven, right? Then they did interviews with the person's family in Florida. Like he said he was coming and he was going to stay with you first and then go to the wife and blah, 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 blah. And we tell us something about Uncle Ryan. Your family's not going to lie for, for you when the, the federal government comes to their door. Do not expect that. Me not like to know about it. I'm not not, nope. Not doing that. <laughs> so exactly. that investigation was super, like 15 pages wow. of investigation. Went to work. Went to the people's work. Went to, um, uh, yeah, family members, ex, the ex-wife, everybody got, got interviewed, right? And so with a finding like that, you can try, let's like say if it was a presumption, you know what, my attorney can't work on this. Okay, I said the fridge was white. My wife said the fridge was um, cream. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a, a different kind of inconsistent thing. Yeah. But when they have like a concrete finding, you cannot overcome mm -hmm. that. Yeah. It's just not worth it. Yeah, as a, um, you know, a beautifully said, as a young attorney, I've, I've tried to fight. Well, in my first two years, I tried to write briefs to try to overcome the the, the finding a marriage yeah. fraud, get affidavits, all mm -hmm. kind of something. Neat. It's extremely, I mean, it, it's, I mean, some attorneys have done it, but it's done in court. Mm -hmm. You kid me, but. That's where I'm fighting one right now. Yeah. I have a fighting chance because it's at the Board of Immigration Appeals. Yeah. But at CIS, if them find that friend. Yeah. And if you can prevent it by having an attorney yes. prepare you, advise you, mm -hmm. then, I mean, a lot of that could be... Could be avoided. Yeah, you yeah. know, and all the, Googlers attorney, all the Google attorneys and TikTok attorneys um, always say you don't, need an, you don't need an attorney for your case. Them same one that they will not be there. Nope. The well, they can. Uh, yeah, and, <laughs> and, they don't under, and people don't understand that our law firms... Mm -hmm. 30 to 40 percent of our firms, our revenue, yeah, comes from people who are redoing, yeah, their immigration case, yeah, that was denied previously yeah. or it was messed up the first mm -hmm. time. So that's what I always say because everybody's like, okay, I can't really afford an attorney. Um, you go to Miss Clancy, and Miss Clancy gets it denied, and now we have to fight the previous denial. Request a copy of your entire record, review all of that refile your case now with like even more evidence than we would have had to done the first time. Like it's going to cost you more yes. the second time than just hiring a lawyer to do it the first time. I tell people all the time, even if you cannot afford an attorney, there are other places that you can go where there are licensed professionals who can help you with your cases. I get it. Not everyone is going to be able to afford our yeah. services. There's legal aid, there's Catholic charities, there's a lot of different places that you can go to help. But see, the reason why I'm all over social media and why I am so passionate about it is because there's so much misinformation in our community. But not only that, the distrust for immigration lawyers is crazy. Yeah. Everybody's just thinking we're all tear for for no money. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be okay if you don't hire us, I promise you. Okay. I Probably. promise. My followers know I do free consultation drives. I'm on live once a week giving information we and my ment I learned all of that from my mentor right so we don't we don't really we need them but we don't really need everybody you understand so if you can't afford it people call my office to ask that question and we give them the referral for where they can go because we, we would rather you guys have the proper accurate advice than you running around the, down the road to Miss Nancy now I know yeah the case smash up and all kind of crazy is happening and then you come with a fraud finding where that we can't help you cannot help you you know yeah uh so changes changing gears staying in immigration court so yes have a scenario for you right um how would you handle this case and let's 
see how legal minds work <laughs> right now. You have an entertainer, uh -huh. a singer or actor. Right. Who has now been detained uh -huh. by ICE right. and is in immigration custody. Mm -hmm. Big bad liar. Tell me how you handle that. First thing, follow the paper trail. I want to know everything that happened before, right? Why are you in immigration court? Usually, let's say it's based on a criminal issue, right? Or I want to see police reports. I want to see the certified record of disposition, like what exactly you were charged with, what you were convicted of, if anything. Can it even be considered as a conviction in immigration court, right? Before we go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Because there are certain crimes that will qualify as crimes involving moral turpitude, right? Which means say, it looks bad on your character as a person, right? Mm -hmm. certain, certain kind of crimes will look like that. Then there are certain things that would be considered as aggravated felonies in the immigration court. And for there are certain benefits that you're just not going to be able to get with all of that, mm -hmm. right? You want to look at the charging document for immigration court, which is the notice to appear. That's the thing that puts you in immigration court and it will tell you why you are in immigration court. So we want to look at that, see which part of the law they have charged this person with in immigration law. So are they even considering the crime or is it the overstating mm -hmm. why they put you in immigration court? If the notice to appear, um, was it served on you properly, mm -hmm. right? There's so many things to consider. So I want to see the papers first before yeah. uh, anything else. Depending on what you find there, then we'll know how to plead at the first hearing in immigration. No. The 10 cases are different because it's going to go like this. You see, Sekou was saying that, you know, it might be two years out for your merit hearing. It's not like that in, in the 10. You understand? Your um, first hearing comes like this. You have to tell them what benefit you're going to be filing for. Again, if you can argue against the notice to appear, then that would be great. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you can't, first thing I'm doing, bond. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> How do I get him out? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh, if you have family members here or um, some reason why we can see, you know, it is better, it's better, better serves the U.S. government, you know, saving their resources by letting me out of here mm -hmm. with a crazy $7,000 bond or something. Mm -hmm. Because depending on why they have detained you, there's certain amounts that they have to charge in bond, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's the first thing. If, if they're detained, you want to look at the papers and try to get them bond. If you can get them bonded out, then they're gonna go. They're gonna switch courts from whatever detention center they're in, but whether it be Chrome or Broward Transitional Center. Yes, my Broward County people, that pink building in Pompano is not a bakery. That is a detention center, <laughs> and they lock people up there as well. So, if they're out of there, they're likely to be transferred to, let's say, if we're talking Miami, they'll be transferred to the Miami Immigration Court, or maybe Orlando, depending on what the address is say or whatever it is. Um, Go when you're transferred to immigration court. Now, if anything has happened in Mr. Celebrity's life that changes the circumstances, we have found something before the next hearing, right? Yes. Because when you get into like the regular immigration court, now the backlog is insane. Yes. And they will not be back in court for a long time. So getting bond is very important for um, someone's detained case if you can get that done. Yeah. Uh, if you cannot get the bond, your individual here is coming very quick. <laughs> so we have to figure out what benefit we can file. How long has Mr. Entertainer been here, right? Has he had good moral character in the time that he's been here? What kind of U.S. citizen family members does he have? What kind of benefit that can we, you know, get for him while he's in immigration court? So if we are not successful, Mr. Man is going back to Jamaica or wherever he comes from. Uh -huh. With a possible bar, with, with a definite bar for a certain amount of years. Uh, but if we are successful, um, maybe you'll be able to overcome it. Again, I always tell people that uh, I'm not scared of immigration court because there's so many more things you can ask for than not exactly be detained. Yeah. So it's not a death sentence, but it's not someplace you want to be. Mm. Yeah. So that's how I would. I know it. I know it. I know it. I mean, I would handle it similarly. I mean, the first thing that I would do is, you know. If there's an entertainer that retained me, yeah, you know who is known, who's popular, that is now detained in mm -hmm. in immigration court, which meaning he's not from here, right? He come from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. The first thing is I would want to talk to him, right? Oh, I would okay. want to talk to him one and two. I would want to look at why is he now in immigration, right? Custody. Exactly. So typically to get into immigration custody, 
It's either one, you're salt because you are you have overstayed. Right. And, and, you're in a slutty care or something. And, <laughs> and, and it, there was some reasonable suspicion mm -hmm. and they detained you because you overstayed. So mm -hmm. um, the, so if that was the situation with the entertainer, uh, um, because of an overstay, I would then plead in their bond hearing that, look, this person has good moral character, right. has not been associated right. with any crimes. Mm -hmm. You know, can they be released on their own recognizance? And we will try to find a relief from deportation, such as asylum. Does he fear going back to his own country because right. of threats? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, uh, that's something I would look at. Is he currently married to a U.S. citizen? Right. Or is he going to voluntary depart? Mm -hmm. That's what I would look at. But say no, Mr. Entertainer has now been um, charged. I look and say that he's been detained because he was charged in an investigation with some type of criminal activity. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's a whole different ball game. Of course. It's a whole different ball game because now I would look at, all right, what type of crime is it? Is it mm -hmm. that felony? Right. right. Is it a misdemeanor? Mm -hmm. Right. Is, is it something that makes him deportable? Right. Right. Meaning it's a crime involving moral turpitude. Right. Those are the things that I would evaluate. Then I would take that and say, all right, um, what are your ties to to to, to the Congress? Yeah. Right. Are you a danger to society? Mm -hmm. So those are the things that I would articulate to the judge and say, all right, you know what? We have this crime here. It's not too bad. But you know what, Mr. Entertainer, he is um, he has great ties to the community. Right. You know. Lots of stage shows, mm -hmm. or name. Mm -hmm. um, he is not a flight risk. Right. Meaning he will not run because he's known, he's popular. Right. He will run. Those are the things that I would articulate. But you know what? That may win, that may not. Yep. So now it boils mm -hmm. down to, yeah, so now it boils back down to do you have any relief from deportation? Mm -hmm. they, and no, I mean, to be honest, it depends on the judge. True. It depends on which judge and yeah. which government attorney that that you have received because you can't have one say, yeah, man, make him one, which is rare, yeah. which is rare. They, they retired. Yeah, exactly. In there, no. <laughs> They're going to say, all right, you know what, we're going to release you after 7, 10, 000, uh, but uh -huh. or we're going to hold you. I know you have to now fight in removal proceedings. Mm -hmm. And please understand, if you have DUIs, dog, you have yourself. I'm not letting you know. Yeah. yeah. That's been your experience too. Mm -hmm. No matter what you say, how many times. I mean, so it also depends on the court too, because I've I've, I've had cases like that mm -hmm. in South Florida. I mean, mm -hmm. They don't even have a talk. Yeah, no. They they don't even have a talk. But then in Orlando, ah, it's the Orlando Immigration Court. Mm -hmm. They release them. Yeah, I've got people with DUIs release who have zero release. What? Cross the border. Yeah, man, in Orlando. <laughs> you know, so it also depends on, as an immigrant, if you know your thing not straight. Yeah. <coughs> make sure you choose wisely where you're going to ditch. Yep. Where you're going to ditch. Is it, is it immigrant friendly? Yeah. Um, within the court system. Right. You know, so those are things that you have to consider. So, you know, um, I've been getting that question a lot. So with the entertainers, you know, if, if you, if, if you don't get detained, right. the first thing is, what's your moral character? Yep. Be, were you involved in any crime? Mm -hmm. did, or, or did anybody inform on you Tell that, that you were a part of a crime? Right. Right. That has been a big thing now. Um, and basically, how did you enter the country? Because how you enter the country, if you enter on a visa versus if you cross the border, it's a different type of financial. So, yep. But can certain entertainers get released while being on a visitor's visa and they don't have, and they're not married to a U.S. citizen? Yes, it is possible because it can be argued that they are good moral character. Right. They have, they are not a flight risk right. because of their, their status, their, 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 their notoriety, mm -hmm. and they have ties to the community. Mm -hmm. So that's that. But here's the better part of the segment. Tell me. Um, what are some of the ways that immigrants can 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 enter the U.S., get a green card without having to go the marriage or asylum route? Right. So there are so many different paths to citizenship. Yes, like I always say, it all depends on an anchor, right? So is it employment? Is it family-based? 
or is it based on some humanitarian factor, right? So yes, family does not only entail marriage, right? Other family members may be able to petition for you, your uncle and your auntie, your cousin, them can do it. But in certain cases, parents and children, children over the age of 21 or a U.S. citizen can petition for their parents, right? So depending on what family member is petitioning for you, that might be available to you. Then under humanitarian, the humanitarian column, people always think that, okay, the only thing I can do is file for asylum. So many other things fall under the humanitarian column. For instance, T visas and U visas. So what a U visa is, is if you were a victim of a certain kind of crime while you were in the United States, you may be able to get status out of that situation, a horrible situation to be in, but um, that may work out for you. So if that has happened to you, you definitely want to sit with an immigration attorney and discuss how that process will go because a U visa process is not a simple process, right? So you want to talk to an attorney about that. Uh, T visas are fascinating. Like if you are trafficked into a country, right? A lot of times people think trafficking, oh, it must be like sex trafficking or something. It, it honestly doesn't have to be like that, you know? Let's say you were three years old and your father bring you in here on somebody else's passport or something. You were trafficked here. You may be able to get a T visa out of that. Maybe. You understand? So that's how T visas work. Of course, yes, to sex trafficking. Also, if um, you came to work with an employer, they're not treating her properly, you may be able to get something out of that as well. Uh, so that's under the humanitarian column. Of course, it's VAWA. Um, again, VAWA entails so much more than being married to a U.S. citizen. I remind people all the time that if you are the parent or child of a U.S. citizen and they have abused you, you can also file VAWA based on that, right? So that's under the humanitarian column. And then so many employment-based options, right? that my mentor deals with out of employment based cases so he can go into that. But yeah, <laughs> the employment based, um, that's another uh, situation. So certain um, employers may be able to petition on your behalf. Um, if you can invest a certain amount of money here, you can, you know, pretty much buy a green cap. Don't it? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. 100%. Mm -hmm. So in like many different ways. Fair point. So, I mean, all the ways that Attorney Hammond's just beautifully articulated. Um, and just to elaborate, like, especially what my firm has been doing underground right now. Mm -hmm. We've been doing a lot of EB2 NIW visas. So those are people who have advanced degrees. So if you have like a master's or a specialized degree. Right. And your job coming to the U.S. is of some type of importance that we can prove that that's a way to get a green card. Mm -hmm. If you're an athlete right, where you have international recognition mm -hmm. or you have extraordinary ability, mm -hmm. you can get a green card or a visa from that, right? If you are a specialized employer, uh, like a chef, where yeah. you have certifications and you are a high-end chef, um, even, I mean, high-end specialized cleaners, yeah. right? A business can petition for you because of your specialized experience. And you can get a green card from that. You can also buy your green card, the EB, um, the EB5. If mm -hmm. you invest 800000 or a million fifty, it depends on where it's located, um, into a business that is new or existing, right. where you're employing at least 10 people, you can get a green card. Mm -hmm. I've even advised people as to how we can use real estate, yep. buying real estate property to drive um, the EB-5 visa to qualify. There's also the E-2 visa mm -hmm. where it doesn't have to be a million fifty. It can be somewhere between 40K, depending on the type of business, to 100, 200K, you can get a visa that way. So, I mean, especially employment. Right. Right? I mean, an employer can petition for you. So, there are many Sorry. ways outside, but you you don't know what you don't know. So that's why I say consult with an attorney, mm -hmm. consult with an immigration attorney mm -hmm. to figure out the different ways, yeah. especially now where there's a labor shortage. Oh, yeah. There are legal ways mm -hmm. to do it, but you don't know. I mean, the other day I did a consultation, um, you know, this case, well, not the other day. It brought tears to my eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, it was um, some parents they mm -hmm. came they are with the church they are missionaries mm -hmm. that you know they got jammed up them overstay mm -hmm. right the whole family is in the church mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So I said, how old is the son? The son is 17, but you know what? He's turning 18 in four weeks. Mm-hmm. We filed an R1 visa. This is a religious visa, mm-hmm. right? A religious visa based on uh, working for a, re- a, a designated 501... Um, 501C? 501C. Religious. Drug, religious organization. The church was able to petition yeah. for the same thing. Same. And he got his R1 visa, right? So what does that mean? He got his R1 visa. With the R1 visa, after two years, Mm -hmm. he'd be able to get his green card. Right. Five years, he'd be able to apply for his citizenship. Then he can apply for his lyrics. So there's the church as well. Mm -hmm. But one of the most important things, why it's, it's, it's so crucial to get the proper advice is all those things I just Explained, if you have an overstay of more than 180 days, all of those are off the table. Yeah. Employment, investment, yeah. all those visas come off the table once you overstay, typically over 180 days. And the only thing, the, the only petitions that can cure an overstay is marriage. Marriage. And if you have a U.S. citizen child, that's over 21 to petition for you. So seek the right advice. Yes. But again, you know, as we close, Attorney Hemans and I, we are both Jamaicans. We are both immigrants. Yep. We both had our own uh, trials and yep. tribulations to get to where we are. Mm-hmm. Both of us came as F1 students and ended up in a situation where we were undocumented for a period. Yeah. Which I learned today. I didn't know we had shared a similar story. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we were both undocumented at some point. But I firmly believe, man, like as an immigrant, especially as a Jamaican, as a yard man, you can't make it anywhere. You yeah. know that Jamaica prepares you for anywhere. Anything, yeah. Because that want that chopping with one. Once you survive <laughs> that, <laughs> once you survive that, you can make it here. You can be successful. Being yeah. undocumented does not, it's, it's not, not a death, death sentence. sentence. So with the proper advice, and having a plan and an immigration strategy, right. you can't be successful here. Mm-hmm. Or to even get around that, just do it the right way from the start. Done. At the end of the day, also, I always tell people, like, we, even us as practitioners, sometimes we don't know everything. But I joke with my, my people all the time that we move like a gang. If me don't know something, yeah. so who is going to know something if I don't handle a certain kind of case? hit the like button if you've ever been referred to second clerk by me <laughs> i may not do that type of case yeah. but i will know somebody who does if i don't know the answer to a question i may, i have a colleague who does and not only that we have people who practice in different areas mm-hmm. that we we will know where to send you if it's not something that we can immediately handle but always try to contact an attorney please i am imploring you this is not the time the immigration of today is not the immigration of 1995 nope. or not even 2020. Nope. Everything so Every year it changed. Everything. Yeah. That the that the um adjustment of status form looks nothing like it looked like before pandemic. That's how long, you know. So you have to be careful. Well, um, where can people find you? Well, um, on social media you can find me on at, at legally trim everywhere. Instagram, uh, TikTok, Twitter, that's where I live, honestly, and also on YouTube. Uh, my office information, um, our information is 954-315-3840. Again, that's 954-315-3840. Email is info at hemanslaw.com. That's also our website, www.hemanslaw.com. You can literally go on the website, send us a message. You will get a response back within 24 hours. My staff is always there to answer the phone between the hours of 9 and 5, which is business hours. And if we've missed the call, we'll, of course, call you back the next day. So we're super responsive, waiting to take your call. We also have people who reach out to us from our law firm's uh, Hemans Law Instagram page. So if you find us in there, you send us a message and you get the information for how to schedule a consultation with my office. So that's where you find me. And you? Nice. So it's Attorney Sekou across all platforms. Sekou is S-E-K-O-U. Attorney Sekou across Instagram, Facebook. YouTube, Twitter, that's where you can find me. The Clark Law Group.com, that's the website. We are located in Orlando, Florida, Panama City Beach, Florida, 
Jamaica, Queens, New York, and Kingston, Jamaica. Mm -hmm. We're there to serve. We are here to serve. And as always, big up on yourself. Big up yourself. Best up. <laughs> Good luck, sir.